really glad to have you all here on this Thursday evening. Um, this is a weekly learning session that we're hosting every single Thursday um, at 5.30 p.m., same time. Um, except actually this time it's the last one for 2021 because we're going to use December to kind of go behind the scenes, gear up, uh, be back in January. And this last session for the year is together with our dear collaborator Marco, who is a videographer, filmmaker, editor, video coach, basically all around a visual storytelling expert. And that's exactly what we're going to dive into is how you can use film and maybe also, yeah, thinking about visual storytelling um, more broadly, how you can use that to, on the one hand, show your impact and rally people behind your mission. And on the other hand, um, potentially to reach more funding and kind of, yeah, really exemplify the problem in a way that makes sense to people. And Marco is definitely the expert to join in on this. Um, you studied filmmaking and journalism, I believe, in London and then moved on to work for CNN, producing feature shows and kind of, yeah, doing the real visual journalism side of things. And then moved into being a self-employed videographer and specializing in social enterprises. And I know you've done a whole bunch of stuff for startups, both kind of explainer videos and also crowdfunding campaigns. So we have a whole spectrum. And I also know you're a musician. So this is just all around a very creative, person and I'm excited to see how we can learn from you today. Um, before we get into that, just overall about the session, it's going to be an hour and it's basically here for you. So whenever you have a question or even just a perspective or thought or anything you want to share, you can either drop it in the chat and we will keep an eye on that. Or if you want, you can also just unmute yourself and talk to us about it and we'll try to figure out a solution together. Um, my name is Ida. I'm the founder of Becoming, which is a growth partner here in Berlin that basically works with impact-driven or purpose-driven startups to help them succeed with branding and marketing. Um, and on the one hand, of course, we, we do that because I personally believe that purpose-driven startups have so much to offer this world and we want you to succeed. And then on the other hand, once you have a bigger voice and you're really using these tools from branding and marketing, you can also become a role model in your industry that changes the system from within. So, you know, it's, it's very much a passion that marketing and branding can do a lot for impact. Um, but we know that these topics are usually quite complex and can feel overwhelming. So these learning sessions are really a place for us to all together try and break it down um, and, and yeah, learn how we can take our best next steps. So whatever challenge you have, we would be really happy to hear it related to today's topic. And with that said, uh, Marco, maybe we could just uh, start off with a little bit of background. How come you're so fascinated by visual communication? How did that happen? What's your journey coming to loving film? Mm, good question. I think, uh, I mean, I always, I was the sort of person who in school, I always knew I wanted to do something with media, but I didn't know exactly what. But I think I was always really into cinema from a very young age growing up in the States. I used to go to the cinema with my parents and just kind of developed a fascination, I think, for, for storytelling. Um, loved music growing up as well. And, and for me, um, film and, and then later on video, when that became more affordable, was just um, a perfect sort of kind of symbiosis of the two, if you know what I mean. It was just... Um, that combination of, of visual beauty, visual prowess, and, and music for me was just the, the ultimate way of evoking emotion, I think, which I guess any art form seeks to do. And I think that's what makes it such a powerful um, medium and, and tool for entrepreneurs as well, because it, it's so effective when done right um, at creating an emotional connection with um, possible customers or, or your target audience, let's say. Mm, definitely. And I forgot to mention that entirely, but also one thing we have in common just for reference is that I also started out as a film director, although um, not in the journalism side, I was actually making horror movies, <laughs> which is maybe not gonna be the topic of today, but yeah, it's a very powerful medium speaking of emotions um, to really work through and connect with people on a wholly different level compared to if you're only, you know, shouting your numbers. No, this is really telling the story. So yeah, it's a really intriguing medium. Um, but to put us all on the same page then, how would you say for the purposes of this hour, like what kind of film 
or what kind of visual storytelling uh, are we really talking about? What's the focus here? Yeah, maybe it's worth mentioning that I think visual storytelling is, is quite a broad term, uh, which can be applied to things like infographics, motion design, even animated GIFs can be visual storytelling or a form of visual storytelling. Um, as you kindly mentioned in your introduction, my area of expertise is moving images, film, video. Um, and so, yeah, the, what I've done, the kind of the formats that have come up time and again in my 10 years as a, a freelance video producer are things like mission statement videos, crowdfunding videos, um, user stories, origin stories. Um, those are the, the kind of the main video formats that I've worked on for purpose, uh, purpose companies. Mm. And obviously what you already mentioned about the emotional connection that you can create through film, that mm. is probably the single biggest benefit of using that as a medium. But then what would you say are some other reasons or why really should startups and entrepreneurs think about using film already from the beginning? Well, I think... Uh, it, particularly um, with regards to purpose-driven companies. As all of you in this chat will know, I think a lot of the time you're selling more than just a, a product or a service. You're selling a, an ethos, a mindset, a lifestyle. And I think on your search for customers, collaborators, partners, you, you're, you're looking to find people from your tribe, people that share that mindset, that ethos, um, and you want to connect with those people. And I think, again, video is, is the perfect format to do that um, because, it is, because it does evoke emotion, because it, it can create trust. Um, it can be a very succinct and concise way of, of basically communicating your, your message and what you stand for. Um, and I think those are all reasons why video is so important. Um, for any business, but especially yeah. for, for purpose companies. And especially also what you mentioned that as a purpose-driven company, it's not only about the product, it's about the bigger problem as well. And, you know, the system usually that that solution fits into. And sometimes I think probably everyone here has been there where you try to explain the problem and you feel yourself just making this whole, um, yeah, story, I guess, but it just takes quite a while to actually explain what the system looks like. Whereas if you would have exemplified that through a story in a video, for example, that shows a person's life changing within the system because of the solution you have, then you don't have to end up in this space where you're over explaining, you're actually showing, not telling. And that's probably also specifically for purpose-driven companies, one of the reasons why it's so important to have this other mode of communicating that's not only just literal words. Yeah, very well put. And I think um, to your point, um, I think one of the most effective formats is actually what I would call an origin story. So where you kind of, um, I've done a few of these where I've kind of had the privilege of, of accompanying uh, founders or members of a purpose company and going to the location where they source their materials, their ingredients for their product, and just being on location with um, you know the, the locals who are are you know farming these products or or creating them, um, and sort of showing how their lives have been affected perhaps by you know fair trade, just to name one example. Um, it's 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 so effective because as you as you say you're 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 showing. Um, the results you're showing how the impact that you're having with your product or your service um, totally um, I just want to say by the way hi to those of you who are joining right now um, Michelle, Pernith, um, Eugenia if I didn't tell you proper hi hi <laughs> and so that you know this is very interactive and it's meant to be so if you have any question any input thoughts anything we can help you with um, just drop it in the chat or raise your hand and we will for sure get around to that so you know um okay so now that we sort of know what we're talking about let's get into sort of the strategy level um when you think about using film to really explain and create this kind of emotional connection how do you decide which part of your impact or your story or your idea should be put in film um, and what should be put through other mediums? How do you usually help people think through that? Um, often a, an effective way to do that is to actually work backwards and to think about what are the strongest visual 
components of my story or of our company's story. So again, if you have, if you source um, material, for example, from a, um, a developing nation, let's say, um, and you know, you have the, the possibility of maybe traveling there and capturing images on the ground and showing how, how the product comes together there, um, that could be very powerful because it's kind of taking viewers out of their day-to-day -day lives and um, showing them a completely different part of the world that they're probably not familiar with. Um, so that could be a very strong visual component. Um, maybe you have a product that's, that's really visual already. Um, and maybe in that case, the product can be the focus of your, your marketing campaigns, your video campaigns. Um, so I, I would recommend sort of working your way backwards and, and really starting with that question. What is the strongest visual component of my business? Um, and then generally speaking, as we've already established, you know, emotions are crucial and they're kind of one of the biggest benefits of using video. So also think about which part of the story evokes the most emotion or has the most potential to evoke emotion. Um, you know, numbers and, and facts, I think, can, can feature in video, um, but my recommendation is always to be quite selective, maybe pick out one or two facts that are really going to strengthen and play to those emotions that you want to evoke, um, but don't overload your, your videos with, with facts. And I think a lot of the time with, with founders and purpose-driven founders, there's a tendency to, to, to want to do that, to sort of... Um, you know, hit people over the head with all this, this information, this data that they've gathered, which is important. Um, but, you know, in a short, maybe two or three minute video can be a little overwhelming and maybe not um, super effective in, in creating that emotional connection. So be a little bit um, picky there and, and really look at, you know, again, which, which part of the story has the strongest visual and has the most potential to create a, an emotional connection. Yeah, so really having that kind of highlight approach. Um, by the way, I think we can drop the link in the chat. We just recently had a session on impact communications and sort of the overload, information overload that can sometimes happen when you communicate around that. So if you're interested about how to pick those numbers, um, you can also check out that session because that is a whole thing in itself for sure. Also, actually, interestingly, um, to mirror back what you were saying, which might add some context, for example, for you, Casper, working in a more industrial setting or B2B setting. I um, worked with a health tech startup that was developing artificial intelligence to basically improve human lives. And I remember once I went to Web Summit, you know, this huge um, conference, and I met uh, this TV executive and they were super interested in the solution and what it can mean for healthcare. Um, but because it was a TV person, they were saying like, look, I'm sorry, we're not gonna be able to really make a real segment on AI because how the hell are we gonna visualize that? you know because we had a software and what are they going to do are they going to show a screen grab of us typing in the thing or are they going to show robots or how are they going to visualize ai and it just it just shows that starting from the perspective of what you actually have in terms of visual assets is a really good piece of advice because otherwise you face this problem of having to put images on something that doesn't always lend itself to to visual storytelling yeah so figuring out like how you're really how you're really going to translate something that's less tangible into something truly visual um, can be tricky and i'm also interested to hear if you have any advice in that kind of situation like how would you have tackled that conversation well i was gonna i was gonna interject and, and say that it sounds to me like he was he was being a little bit lazy there because you know, part of your, your job as a video producer is to, to find solutions and to find ways of visualizing things that are difficult to visualize. Um, and it's about thinking out of the box a little bit and, and gathering lots of inspiration from places like Vimeo and Pinterest and, and just kind of finding, you know, interesting, engaging and entertaining um, little, um, little stylistic things that, that help to tell the story. It can be things like stop motion animation. It can be motion design, integrating, um, you know, um, digital graphics into a, you know, real world footage. Um, you know, there's a bunch of tools that you can use. And yes, they, they are complicated, they are complex and they require quite a lot of creativity. And so I think a lot of 
producers kind of shy away from that. But um, I think, you know. Not you. <laughs> That's great. I mean, it also actually highlights another bias, I think, which is not the case only in video, but very much the case in pitching in general. And when it comes to startups is that you often think that what you have to put front and center is the product. And what they were essentially asking me is how are we going to visualize the product? And they found that to be a problem. But the thing is, you always have a user who experiences something in interaction with your product. And even if it's a software, I mean, you know, they have a visual life around them that they're living where your product plays a role. And you can always tell the story from the user's journey yeah. in a visual way without necessarily showing 100%, you know, this is the literal experience of the product itself, but more like this is where it fits in the grand scheme of the problem we're solving. And that's actually a mindset shift that I think film can help you to make. True. So um, let me ask you, because I know you heard or you said that as well, um, that you've worked on so many different types of films. So for like crowdfunding, obviously it can be a part of an investment pitch, but it can also be just marketing and communications in general towards your audience. So um, how would you say that you should tailor your thinking or tailor your um, approach to the storytelling, depending on the type of video that you're creating? Mm. Yeah, I think it's super, super important to have your, your target audience, your target demographic in mind at all times when you're developing a, a script or an idea for a video, um, as well as the use case. So thinking about where it's going to be shown, is it for YouTube, is it for social media, is it for um, your, your web page, uh, an email marketing campaign? Um, those, are, those are two things that will have a big impact on or should have a big Im impact on the tone that you choose and also on, on the content. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of what I mean, I mean, if you're, if you're creating a pitch video that's directed at investors, they, I'm generalizing here, but they tend to care more about numbers, facts, growth, right? So maybe for once you can actually create a vid video that features a few more um, of, of these kinds of numbers. Although you might even, it, you know, you might even be better off, to be honest, in this particular case, just creating a PowerPoint presentation or a PDF. Maybe video isn't even necessary if you're pitching to investors. Um, if you're creating something for, for social media, for like a, uh, an Instagram ad, let's say, you're, you're, you're trying to reach a cold audience that doesn't know your service or product, right? So you have to grab their attention in a very short time span, because as we all know, we, you know, we scroll through the feed and it's really there you only have a split second really to to grab someone's attention so you need a really strong opening and it generally pays off to keep it quite short because on instagram people tend not to consume long video um crowdfunding videos bring again a whole another kind of uh let's say framework with them uh, generally, they tend to be directed at warm audiences, right? A lot of the time, it's like your your friends, your family, or maybe experienced crowd funders on platforms like Start Next um, that kind of will see your video and will will consider uh, funding you. And generally, they want to see you and hear from you. They want to see your face. They want to hear your voice. They want to hear your story. They want to hear what inspired you. And so I think in this case, you have a license to make it very personal and actually make it about your own journey as a founder. Um, that can be very beneficial in, in this particular case. So, you know, just kind of keeping your target audience and, and your end format or your use case in mind uh, when, when developing the story idea, I think is, is really important. Yeah, that's so true. And I mean, also building on that in terms of thinking strategically, um, also thinking about the purpose or sort of like the effect you would like for it to have uh, on that particular audience. For example, with an investor, the goal might be for them to feel that you are more credible. It could be the case. And then you would have to show that in a certain type of way to make sure that you're uh, emphasizing, you know, whatever it might be that the stability of your supply chain or the credibility of your vision or whatever it might be. Whereas in a crowdfunding campaign toward um, what we would otherwise think of as like the general public. And this is something we might get into when we show a few examples. Um, it might be more important, for example, to be really entertaining because you have to be the one 
to let people feel that they can be a part of this exciting journey. Um, and that's a slightly different message than just trying to convey that you're a credible founder. It's more that this is something we're doing together. This is something you can be a part of. Um, and it has like a very different, it, well, it requires a slightly different message and a slightly different approach. So uh, before we go into looking at some films, because I'm sure we're all excited to get inspired, um, some of us might think from the way we're talking about this that it would be super expensive and that it's just something that you have to invest in. So the first question would be, do you think this is something we should think of in terms of an investment ourselves? Um, and second of all, does it even have to be expensive or how do you see that trade off? Oh, yeah, this is a tricky one. I thought about this a lot. Um, I, it, it certainly is an investment, not, not necessarily monetary, but it's going to require time. It's going to require energy to create something professional, right? That tells your story um, that you can use as an, an evergreen over and over again, that people will want to watch and share, and that's engaging. That's going to take a lot of um, thought and, and also um, energy to make it happen. So it's definitely an investment on, on every level. Does it have to be expensive? No. Um, you kind of asked me one of the questions uh, before in, in the briefing was, you know, when should you invest in filmmaking? And I think my the answer I came up with is make a video when you're in a position to create a professional video. Um, because I think unprofessional video can do more harm than good and be a real turnoff. Um, and unless you have a background in video or filmmaking, I would personally advise against a DIY approach. Obviously, I'm a little bit biased because I'm a service provider, but um, this is this would be my recommendation. That doesn't have that doesn't mean necessarily that you have to wait until you get funded. For example, it just means that you have to be a little bit creative. Um, and there are options. So, for example, you could try to find a videographer who is really excited about your idea um, and or about your crowdfunding campaign, for example. And rather than, you know, offering him, you know, two or three thousand euros up front, which he might normally charge for a video, you could instead offer him a percentage of the total crowdfunding sum in the event that the crowdfunding campaign is successful. And what that will do is that will in incentivize him even more to create something special. Um, so it's kind of beneficial all around in, in my opinion that approach and that's something that I've I've done in the past and that's that's worked out um, quite well or in other cases um, you might be able to offer them exposure uh, or maybe you have connections to lots of other potential clients for them that could be of interest so think about um, you know when sort of pitching or looking for for service providers or, or videographers video producers to, to work with and collaborate on a video think about what you can offer them beyond money if if you're bootstrapping and you know you don't have tons of money lying around for for video production it, again, it doesn't have to mean that you you don't necessarily need, you know, funding. Um, also, you can you can try to come up with a, a really creative or engaging concept that that is inexpensive to to realize. Um, and you know, things like you know, technology these days is is really affordable. So, for example, something like a, a green screen setup, which used to cost hundreds or even thousands of euros is now available for you know 100 euros on amazon you can buy the complete setup including lights and green screen and everything and it's super easy to do um and it doesn't have to cost a lot it, you can transport yourself to anywhere in the world with a green screen and get really creative with it just one example you know but um if you can come up with a, a concept that is inexpensive to to produce then obviously, you know, that's another way of, of saving money. Um, and that doesn't and I, have yeah. necessarily take away from, from the quality or the, or the message or the, um, the power of the video. And I think you're also highlighting something really important that 
plays into how the whole service provider paradigm is also changing that as a startup especially you don't have to think about the people you work with in that way as fully external most of the time especially as a purpose-driven company we want to be a part of the journey we want to help you grow you know it's not just the case that you come in you do one thing and then you leave and take the money and run um this is not where service providers are moving at least not <laughs> according to us so you know you can stay open to that as well and i think it's a really good point um, alrighty, so let's check out some video and see what we can learn. Um, Marco had a little list here. We're going to start with one from the Rainforest Alliance. I don't know, you, do you want to intro anything about it? What should we be looking for? Um, I think this is just a, an, an incredibly entertaining, engaging, and, and fun fun one. One of I was looking through through examples and through you know videos I've bookmarked in the past, and I think this one really stands out as one of this one always makes me smile. It's just it's just a really fun watch. <laughs> And, and effective at, at sort of conveying a message at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I would love, based on everything we've said, but also everything you already know, for those of you watching right now, if you could put in the chat as you're watching what you resonate with or what you think they do well, then we can pick up on that afterwards and try and analyze it together. I'd be very intrigued um, to see that. So um, let me share, and then I'm curious to hear. You are a good person. You spend time with your family. You work out at the gym. Come on, push, push. You can serve water while showering. You like nice clothes. You give to charity, you recycle. You drive a Prius, but you use your bike when you can. You enjoy the occasional distraction at work, and you always send a card on Mother's Day, always. But there's a part of you that tells yourself that you're not so good, that you could be doing more, that the world is falling apart at the seams, and all you've been doing is yoga. One day, you see that the rainforest is being destroyed at a staggering rate of 32 million acres a year. That's the equivalent of one football field every 78 seconds. You feel bad, angry, guilty. You've been apathetic for too long. You want to do something about it. You must do something about it. Well, this is what you're not going to do. You're not going to quit your job, leave your family, get on the next flight to Nicaragua, take a bus to the edge of the jungle, then hoof it across rivers, lakes, and streams on a quest to the very heart of the rainforest. Take me to the heart of the rainforest. You're getting closer. You're almost there. You have arrived. You're not going to ingratiate yourself with the local tribesmen, go to great lengths to earn their respect and trust. No, 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 no. It is around now you realize you're living out the cliche gringo fantasy of becoming an honorary native and leading the resistant forces but screw it if they could do it so can you i'm gonna save you this guy comes over here i'm gonna do this i'm gonna pull a zap thing that's right through him right over here you're not gonna coordinate and occupy the rainforest movement realize it's hopeless summon the power of the gods lead a revolution against the deforesters and their multinational employers in an apocalyptic once and for all battle to save humanity Awaken two days later in an El Salvadorian hospital with two toes missing on your left foot. <laughs> Hobble out of Central America, up through Mexico, across the Sierra Madre, where you break down, have your first cigarette in four years, accidentally start a wildfire, killing off the endangered species that once served as your occupational distraction, finally make it back home, only to find you've been replaced at work by a guy named TJ, and that things at home are not what they used to be. You're not going to do any of these things, but what you can do is follow the frog. Buying Rainforest Alliance certified products ensures the future of our rainforests so that you don't have to do the things you shouldn't do anyway. Just follow the frog. Woo! <laughs> so that was exciting. Um, let me check the chat. Very relatable, very clear. You just said signal is horrible, but feels dynamic and easy to follow. Who was the audience wondering about the length? Um, yeah, maybe Marco, do you want to start us off and say what you really appreciate about this, uh, what you think we can learn from this? 
Um, yeah, I think it kind of goes back uh, to what we were saying at the very start, how it, video is an opportunity for purpose-driven companies to really connect with their tribe, with, with the people that share the kind of ethos and mindset and lifestyle that, that, that you live uh, on a daily basis. And I think, um, you know, this, this video manage, manages to tap into and cater to that emotion very well. Maybe that, that sense of guilt that we all, all feel at times, uh, that longing to, to be active, to, to feel empowered, to, you know, that, that, that need to, to do more. Um, it, it does it obviously in an incre incredibly engaging, entertaining, pacey, humorous way. Um, that's just an adventure, right? That's fun to, to watch, um, very fast paced. And it ends with a very, as, as someone in, in the chat said, with a very clear and, and concise message that really ties it together beautifully, you know, um, and rounds it off in a perfect way. And interestingly, Caspar made this point, Judith made this point, is it too long? How should we think about length? And who do you think the audience was here? Or was it destined for YouTube to begin with? Good question. It is a little bit on the long side for um, this kind of video, although I think because it's so pacey and because so much happens in it um, and it really takes us on this trip, on this journey, um, you know, as, as everyone's kind of agreeing in the chat, it's, it's, it's fun, it's engaging. And so it doesn't feel long. I mean, it, it didn't to me. Um, and so I would say, you know, length is, is secondary really for this kind of video. Maybe it, it wouldn't, perhaps these days, I mean, it's from, I think, 2012 or 2013. So it's, it's aged well, I would say, but maybe I think with Instagram, you know, things have gotten even more fast paced, attention spans have gotten even less and smaller and slimmer. And so maybe it wouldn't work as like an Instagram ad uh, these days, but I think it's very shareable content. And I think on a platform like YouTube, it's, it's perfect. And Facebook probably as well. I think it would work well um, or it did work well. What's also interesting here is that um, another part that we often talk about and come back to is brand, which is the core of your company and the values that you have and the purpose that you're trying to convey. And what's interesting about that is that if you have a really clear idea of your brand, then every part of your communication after that, including the way you make your films, should reflect the kind of experience you want to give people. So for example, I know for a fact that uh, as part of Becoming, when we were working together, you and me, Marco, um, I was thinking in my head like, oh shit, no, we need to make this video super short because otherwise we're going to lose people. It's not going to work. And then we also worked with um, a brand strategist, Leonie, who's another one of our core collaborators. And she just said, hey, Ida, one of the core things you offer people is the op opportunity to break and to really look at strategy, for example. And you kind of, tr we try to give people space to breathe. And then what we came up with also is the kind of um, insight that, well, if our video is slightly longer and slightly lower paced, it's actually an experience that's relevant for our brand and what we stand for. So it's important when it comes to these things like length or formats that you also think about how it reflects you accurately. Um, and conveys you as a brand, as opposed to only following the rules. Marco's like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's move on to uh, a second one, which is quite different. And I'm really intrigued to see um, how you make sense of this one uh, that's coming from Greenpeace. So one second, I will put it on. Um, sharing my screen. <clears throat> All right, feel free to comment in the chat. Here we go.
All right, so that was quite different than what we just saw before. Um, really curious to hear in the chat, or even just if you want to unmute yourself, what was your impression of that? Did it speak to you? What kind of emotional experience did you have watching that, or did it do anything for you? If anyone wants to share, I would be really curious to hear. All right, well, oh, Marcello, yes. Yeah, I did have a comment. So for me, that um, was, yes, um, touching in the sense that it related to, you know, something very human, which is breathing and uh, connected with something much greater than that. Um, so that that struck for sure a chord. But yeah, I think uh, opposite to the other one, they didn't give that, you know, clear step that we can all take. Um, so in that sense, I liked it less. So I could see this one maybe be more for like brand general brand awareness, uh, more than actually you know moving the needle on you know actually making a making a step. So that's that was the difference I saw. Yeah, I think what's really also interesting is that this is obviously a nonprofit uh, because it was Greenpeace, and usually that is a slightly slightly different approach because. As you know, with uh, climate change campaigning in general um, and environmental campaigning, um, it's very tempting to use the fear of what's happening to the climate to kind of motivate people with that emotion in particular. And a lot of nonprofits have to do that because what they're looking for is the immediate donation or the immediate action. Um, and I'm very interested to see if anyone else had that uh, response when they watched this. But when I first saw it, it's, it sort of sparked my fear around, oh no, we're completely messing with the climate. We're killing our oceans. We're all dying. And you know, my brain starts to spin and then I get very afraid. And then I think, wait, I have to do something. And then I don't know what to do. So I usually donate to the organization um, that put out that video. But if you are a startup that has a more holistic view on how you're a part of the solution and you maybe want people to engage with your brand, not only give you something in the here and now, which again relates back to the purpose, it's very important that you can also show, as Marcello said and touched upon, like what the solution is and how you are part of the solution and help people get to the point that they feel inspired to be a part of, of the solution as opposed to only afraid of the problem that they're facing. And I'm curious to hear, Marco, how you see that, but I see that as one of the, the things I've observed that's the biggest difference between nonprofits and for profits is that nonprofits have to play more mm -hmm. on the fear um, than for profit companies do. Yeah, and, and to me that always feels a little bit old fashioned because I think by now, you know, we all know the, the problem. Um, and I think a lot of us feel really helpless in our day to day lives and we want to feel empowered, right? We want to feel we're looking for solutions. And so uh, I think, you know, fear is not, is not something that we, we need or, or want. We already have plenty of it, um, most of us anyway. Um, yeah. yeah, just to get back to, to this particular video, um, the reason I, I chose it is just to, to show people, to show you guys that um, I, the, the, the idea um, is really the key, you know, this, this video wouldn't have been very expensive for them to produce. Um, they probably have access to these kinds of time lapses because they're Greenpeace and they have photographers all over the world, but it would it wouldn't be very expensive for, for anybody to create this kind of video. You could easily license these kinds of time lapses uh, on Shutterstock or any other stock video site and just underlay it with you know, these breathing sound effects. Um, so it really doesn't take much to create something quite poetic, moving, something that moves the needle, as Mar Marcello said, or something that, um, as uh, Sonia said something that's that's multi-sensory, that's immersive, as you, Eugenia mentioned, something that, that gets you thinking. Um, the, the idea is, is, is really the key. It doesn't necessarily need a huge budget um, all the time. That's why, that's why I chose this video, just to show that it's possible to, to create something quite powerful with uh, little budget. Can I and probably, oh yes. I just wanted to add oh. to that. I think what's so amazing about that particular video is I think um, it, there's something in uh, 
to be able to connect to something that we all can resonate with and we all know how to breathe. It's a part of its life. Without that, we're, we're, we're dead. So um, uh, being able to uh, imagine the earth and the elements breathing and when they stop breathing, they, that means that it's also dead. So um, that one element and that multi-sensory element is yeah. vital to connect uh, the viewer um, in an emotional way to the environment. Exactly, it's a, it's a really beautiful analogy. And I think it's, it is quite repetitive, but I think the repetition is effective because as a viewer at some point, you, you really start to think, okay, what is this all about? Why am I being asked to watch this for a minute and a half? What are they trying to tell me? And, you know, that, that fact right at the end, um, again, just ties it together beautifully and the, the, the needle kind of drops um, and, or the pin drops rather, and, uh, and suddenly it all makes sense and, and ties it all together. Um, so yeah, I, I like that. that's beautiful. And it is a very good expression of how it can usually feel to be in nature, which again is also part of what they want to achieve, that they want to connect people to the meaning of nature. Even if they can't put people out there, they can make this feeling appear through film. And that's again, the power of cinema and the power of video. So uh, we do have another one that you made that I want to show because it's more on the crowdfunding side, as, as we said, like really showing the face of the founders and what that can look like. Um, it's four minutes, but I thought uh, in between, actually, I'm curious to hear this question that is probably the most important for a lot of us. What are the key mistakes or pitfalls um, that startups tend to fall into when it comes to producing video content? And what would you suggest we can do to avoid that? Uh, yeah, so um, things that I see all the time when, I, when I'm browsing um, and I get shown ads are things like, bad audio, which is something that kind of falls by the wayside. A lot of companies and a lot of even videographers um, sort of invest a lot in um, camera equipment and make sure that the image is beautifully framed. But then, you know, if you have, if you pair that with, with really terrible audio and you're getting a lot of static on the soundtrack and, you know, it's difficult to understand the, the founders, um, it kind of ruins it and it just, it does, it, comes across very unprofessional. Um, and so that's something that a lot of, uh, a lot of um, companies don't really pay that much attention to or don't, don't invest that much in. That's something to look out for. I think something else I see quite a lot is um, presenters or um, often founders um, presenting, looking quite uncomfortable or just not being particularly engaging because maybe they're they're reading off of a teleprompter or because they've memorized the script and they're a little bit robotic in their delivery because you know maybe they don't have that much experience doing it. And what I would say is try to try to avoid that, obviously. So either if you know you're you're really uncomfortable in front of the camera, ask uh, one of your co-founders or colleagues um, maybe to present instead, or maybe even consider get hiring an actor um, to to present. Sometimes, uh, and actually, um, this kind of uh, this is kind of relevant to the video we're about to see. Um, sometimes, just sort of finding your own tone can 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 be the key. Uh, what I mean by that is, for example, in this next video, we're about to see one of the founders. Initially, all the takes we did, he was actually reading off of a teleprompter. And it, it just, we all kind of agreed that it didn't really feel engaging. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't powerful. And so he kind of went off script and he just started to freestyle rather than sticking to the script and, 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 and reading it um, as we'd originally written it. And, and that solved the problem. Suddenly he was super, you know, he, he was very dynamic with his body, with his hand gestures, and it just made the whole thing feel a lot more energetic. And sometimes just sort of finding out what makes you tick or what works for you um, can be the key to success with regards to, to presenting. So just try stuff out as well. And if you've tried out several things and you kind of still feel uncomfortable and feel like it's not your thing, maybe think about getting help from somebody else and having an actor present uh, would be my advice there. And then the third and final thing that I've, no I've, I've noted down is 
is is convoluted um, messaging. So um, you know, I think it's it's really important to be concise um, with regards to the message that you're trying to send or the emotion that you're trying to evoke. And if I'm watching a two minute video and after a minute, I still ha don't really know what you're trying to sell me or what you're trying to make me aware of, then, you know, I'm going to switch off probably, um, unless it's Greenpeace and they have these stunning visuals compared with these, you know, very moving breathing sounds. Um, that's an exception, but generally speaking, it's, I think it's really important to be precise in your messaging and from the very get go, um, yeah, those are kind of the three pitfalls, I would say. So bad audio, uncomfortable presenters, and, and convoluted messaging, things to look out for. I actually had the sense that Greenpeace was very on point. They knew exactly what kind of emotion they wanted to convey yeah. and what their message was Absolutely. going to be. So even though they didn't literally tell you, um, they showed you. And that's the other thing that I would add to your list is show, yeah. don't tell. That's why you have video. Mm -hmm. And even though we're going to watch a film now with founders kind of explaining themselves, um, it's really important because you do that as well in this video to show what that actually looks like and to show um, how that impacts people rather than only filming a pitch, which you for sure can do to add something that's truly visual and that actually tells the story. Um, should, we, should we give some context or, or not? <laughs> uh, yeah, feel free, feel free. So this is a, a crowdfunding video um, I made um, in 2013 or 14, I think it was, for um, a condom company called Einhorn, who are now pretty established and well known here in Germany. Um, but back then it was literally just the two founders. They had an idea, they approached me sort of early on in the process before they'd even started their company and uh, basically pitched uh, a trip to Malaysia. That was their, their whole thing. They didn't really have a lot of budget, but they just said, hey, we wanna, we wanna create condoms that are fair trade, that are vegan. And we've already got this factory in, in Malaysia where we know we want to produce them. And we want to go there and kind of tell our origin story and show people where these condoms are, are, are coming from and how, you know, the workers in these factories are being treated and, and so on. And I was like, sounds great. Sounds like an adventure. Let's, let's do it. And, and we hopped on a plane together and, um, and, and made it, made it happen. Um, yeah, I think that's enough context. I think you just, I think it's, so too. It's a little on the long side because it is, a, it's a crowdfunding video. So we felt like we had license to make it a little bit longer than kind of like social media ads. Um, but um, hopefully it's uh, engaging and dynamic nonetheless. So just a caveat, everyone, it's in German, but there are subtitles. So I hope because it's a video session that you actually have access to the video. Um, so you can also read the subtitles. Um, here we go. Hi, wir wollen das beste Kondom der Welt herstellen. Aber was macht deine Kondome so besonders? 500 Geschmacksrichtungen. 100% Wasserdicht. 100% Orgasmusgarantie. 9000 Größen. Oder maßgeschneidert. Ökologisch korrekte Verpackung. Für Einhorn ein Muss. Mein Lieblingsgeschmack? Einhorn Single Mord on the Rocks. Warum wir Experten für Kondome sind? Wir haben ein Buch darüber gelesen. Jetzt mal ehrlich. Wer glaubt denn nach den ganzen Werbequatsch? In Wirklichkeit sieht es doch so aus. Kondome kaufen ist einfach peinlich. Ihr kennt das alle. Man ist im Supermarkt und findet sie irgendwo zwischen Binden, Tampons, Windeln und Schwangerschaftstests. Very sexy. Deshalb wollen wir Einhornkondome anonym und einfach im Internet anbieten. Kondome sind teuer. Verdammt teuer. Kondome kosten in der Herstellung unter 10 Cent, werden aber in Deutschland für bis zu 2 Euro das Stück verkauft. Was soll das? Einhorn fühlt sich verantwortlich und deshalb werden wir 50% der Profite in gemeinnützige Projekte investieren. Zum Beispiel Sexualaufklärung für Jugendliche. Kondome sind ein Lustkiller. Allein das Öffnen der Verpackung nervt einfach. Einhorns Ziel ist es, Kondome nutzerfreundlich, ökologisch und sexy zu verpacken. Aber vor allem der Inhalt zählt. Unsere Kondome sind von Profis designt und beschränken sich auf die wichtigsten Features. Okay, check. Das ist die Pflicht. Aber wir wollen mit euch die Kühe. Geht es überhaupt? Wir sind für euch an die Quelle gereist. 
der größten Naturkautschukproduzenten der Welt. Kuala Ketil im Norden des Landes ist außerdem die Wahlheimat des Kondomurgesteins Klaus Richter. In der Fabrik von Richter Rubber werden pro Jahr eine halbe Milliarde Kondome hergestellt. Hier wird demnächst das erste Einhornkondom sustainable vom Band rollen. Weil Klaus gerne alles unter Kontrolle hat, baut er die Maschinen selbst nach deutschen Standards. Das bedeutet, Sicherheit steht an erster Stelle. Alle Kondome werden einzeln getestet. Gar nicht so einfach, wie es aussieht. In Klaus haben wir einen echten Geistesbruder gefunden. Er ist einer der wenigen Kondomhersteller, dem Natur und Nachhaltigkeit nicht nur auf dem Papier wichtig sind. Das ist die Frage, wie die nächsten Generationen weiterleben können. Und das geht eben nur mit Nachhaltigkeit. Und das auf die Produktion zu übertragen von Latex, ich denke, das ist möglich. Doch woher kommt eigentlich die Latexmilch? Zum Beispiel von einer Kautschukplantage wie dieser. Also Waldemar zapft jetzt äh, das erste eigene Latex. Das ist ganz schön schwierig anscheinend. Und wenn man zu tief schneidet, dann verletzt man den Baum nur. Da kommt keine Milch raus, Philipp. Aus dieser Milch werden also Kondome hergestellt. Das wollen wir ändern. Und dazu brauchen wir euch. Mit eurer Kaufentscheidung können wir eine Kautschuk-Kooperative in Malaysia gründen, die Bauern fair entlohnen und gemeinsam mit einer deutschen Uni nachhaltigen Kautschukanbau in der Region etablieren. Keine Chance für Greenwashing. Alles, was ihr dafür tun müsst, ist wie gewohnt Sex haben. Gerne auch ein bisschen mehr. Natürlich mit Einhornkondom. Kauft jetzt euren 100 Gramm Jahresvorrat oder spendet für eine gute Sache. Glaubt ihr an Einhörner? Dann geht mit uns auf Einhornfang. <lacht> all right. What did you all think? I really want to hear. Just one quick thing. If you're wondering why there are those strange uh, horse sounds every now and again, it's because we had to censor the video because they got sued. Uh, for making uh, flames uh, of being, I think, the, the, the best condom or the most sustainable condom or something like that. So we had to go back and censor it. And wow. <laughs> As Marcello said, it's really honest. And sometimes you can be so honest that you get sued, apparently. Yeah. Um, I had the sense when I was watching this that it had multiple videos in one. It had mm -hmm. the part that really explains the user experience of standing at the aisle and thinking, okay, I don't know how I feel about the purchase I'm about to make, which is like a part of how we can experience buying condoms. But then it also had the founder story and it also had the supply chain community feature. You had so much going on. I could also imagine after this, editing out specific parts and you know making them all play by themselves as well. Uh, Eugenia yeah. says it was not made in one afternoon. <laughs> Probably not, right? No, no, definitely not. It was uh, several months worth of work. Um, but but it was worthwhile and it, it's still, even though it's like seven, no, even eight years old now, I still get um, a lot of positive feedback and, and other companies approaching me because they've seen this video. So it, it, it paid off for, for me as well. Um, you know, even though I, in this particular case, we had this deal that I was telling you about earlier where there was no money up front, but there was the promise of getting a certain percentage of the total crowdfunding sum and so um what was, was the sum um i think they um in the end they needed a hundred thousand i think to to make it happen to start the company which they got and i think um we agreed on two percent so two thousand euros which was pretty cheap considering the amount of hours the, the amount of man hours that i put into it but uh Nonetheless, it's paid off. They're still a client of mine and they've become very close friends of mine now. So it that's was all lovely. Right. And uh, as Sonia says, it really shows how passionate they are. I think that's what you were saying in the beginning when you remove the teleprompter and you tell them, hey, your company is literally translates to unicorn. So why yeah. not, you know, dress up in unicorn costumes and say whatever you want to say and portray your personality. Yeah. Um, this is how you get to build a real emotional connection as well. It's the same when you make friends as when you watch people on a video, you want to see their true selves and you want to get a sense of their personality.
Absolutely. And I think um, so the, that, that start, that the beginning of the video, which is quite silly with all these different backgrounds and the costumes, they kind of convinced me of that. I wasn't on board initially. I wasn't too keen on that. I thought it was too silly. And it, it's not really my humor, to be honest. But um, it worked really well for, for, for a German speaking audience. And I think what it did was it allowed um, their personalities to shine through and for them just to strike this very unusual tone. And it's very like, as, as Marcello said, honest and, and very lighthearted tone, which um, is a big part of their brand, right? I mean, in, in terms of their packaging, they are a very lighthearted and fun company, very design orientated, very colorful, vibrant. And so I think, um, you know, in that first video, right off the bat, we managed to kind of establish that, that branding and that tone. Um, and uh, by the way, everyone, I know we're at time. We're just going to go over with a couple of minutes so we can get some final pieces of advice from Marco in a quick round. Also, Praneeth says in the chat that it felt ordinary or kind of expected at the start, but then it kind of unfolded how much impact they have in the community. And actually, again, with a brand point, that's the thing about Einhorn. Uh, if you live here in Germany and you see their packaging, they're so colorful, they're so playful. They are this like unicorn costume people. But then what the video does is it kind of really shows what comes underneath that and the depth that the company also has, which in itself is actually quite smart because it does represent the company very well. So quick fire without going into too much depth. Um, what do you think are the top three best practices that we should all right now implement to make better visual content? Best practices to make better visual content. Um, so I think hmm, authenticity, definitely, you know, so find, find a, a tone of voice um, that suits you and your brand that you feel comfortable um, portraying or that you feel comfortable um, bringing across, right? Again, going back to the point about uncom being uncomfortable in front of the camera, ma make sure that you have a storyline and a, a tone that, that, that suits you, that you feel comfortable with, you, that you're proud of, right? You want to create a video that, that you're really proud of and you're happy to share with in po possible investors, customers, and so on. You don't want to be embarrassed. Um, so that's, I think that's really important. Also, because I think audiences have such a strong sense of authenticity and they can immediately smell or feel if someone is perhaps feeling uncomfortable or being slightly disingenuous, you know what I mean? Um, so I think authenticity is really important these days. Um, humor, I think, can be a great way to break the ice and engage, um, but it doesn't suit every brand, right? And it's something that's hard to do well. So use it with caution, I would say, but it can be very, very effective. Um, and then I, I think, Maybe this is quite general, but I, I guess just don't, don't be afraid to to do something out of the ordinary and, and stand out because, you know, there is simply so much video content out there and, you know, we're being bombarded with it with it every day. And if you can come up with, with something that's a little unique um, in your niche that kind of stands out, I think that will bode well for you. And maybe also uh, one thing I would add that I think all of these videos uh, can do quite well. Make sure that you're conscious about who you put as the main character in your story, because usually you want the person watching to identify emotionally with the story you're telling. And usually that means that the user or the person that you know this audience represents, they should be the main character, which means it's not always the case that you as a founder, for example, or that the head of the startup should always be the main character it can be better to do what you did here when you showed the aisle or in the first video where we showed the real emotional experience of wanting to care but not knowing how about the climate, for example. Make sure you're conscious about who you put there in the center. Um, oh, Eugenia asks if she thinks, or if we think that a unique video could backfire for our startup. Maybe we can answer that quickly as well. Can a unique video backfire for a startup? Um... I would say there's probably more more to gain than there is to lose. I I would argue because I think if you have a really run of the mill startup something um, video, sorry that that everybody's seen before with you know standard ukulele soundtrack and you know typical voiceover and the animations that we've seen a million times. I, I don't know. I think people's tendency is to to switch off pretty quickly. Um, 
I think also having a really strong brand understanding, like being reflected on your values and purpose and all these things we also touched upon, that helps you be more confident because mm -hmm. the way you stand out is then something you can say, well, we do it this way because it reflects our values. In the case of Einhorn, it's very much like that. They're so aware of wanting to be playful um, mm -hmm. and at the same time in depth with their community and caring in that way that this is only a representation of them and it does make it unique, but not because someone said, let's be unique, it's because they wanted to be themselves. So the more reflected you are on your own brand and yourself um, as a founder and as a startup, the more confident you can be in the choices you make it automatically that pushes you to be unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would well, say. Then. Also, final uh, input as a fellow filmmaker that I see not nearly enough people using, um, use close-ups of people. Um, it's so tempting when we start making films, we're thinking like, oh yeah, big picture, I'm gonna show how it's all unfolding. But if you really wanna convey emotion, you have to give people a sense of watching it on another person's face and really feeling that. Um, so use close-ups, <laughs> the small and easy thing, good audio, good close-ups that already takes you far. So uh, Marco, thank you so much for joining and thanks everyone Pleasure, for all of you. your input and you know staying on board with watching all of this i had really a lot of fun actually um thanks a lot for engaging with that mm -hmm. and we recorded this so it'll also be sent out to you if you ever want to re-watch it and we'll also send a list that links to these videos if you want to dig into it more or share them or anything like that um this is as i mentioned in the beginning the last event for this year because we're going to be gearing up in december shifting around some things and be back in january um but because this is the very beginning of this whole event series it would actually be super meaningful if you have 30 seconds right now to offer us a bit of feedback so i'm putting um a quick google form in the chat and if you did have the space for yeah just like a 30 second keyword feedback that would be really awesome we really appreciate it um, and if you want to continue the conversation, uh, I, I'm sure both Marco and I would love for you to find us on LinkedIn, for example, or, you know, um, reach out with your questions and your thoughts, really interested to hear more. And with that said, I hope you have a really awesome Tuesday and that we'll see you again for one of our next and upcoming sessions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so Bye -bye. much for being here. Ciao. See you.